Hello, this is Professor Lou here with Lauren Welch. Hi, guys. We're going to do our first crit clash. Lauren, I hope you are ready. Oh, I think I am. I think I'm going to beat you in this. I don't know about that, but we'll see. Basically, we are going to be debating about that famous okay. piece of banana and duct tape. But before we get started on that, if you have not been here before, we are artprof.org. We have video tutorials, critiques, monthly art dares, pro development resources. Our site is 100% free. If you guys like what we do and you don't want to miss out on anything, I would highly suggest that you subscribe and that you ring the bell to make sure you get all of our content. Okay, let's dig into this. Now, here are the terms of the Crit Clash. <laughs> Basically, for those of you guys who have not been here before, we are assigning a very specific point of view. Lauren is gonna argue for the banana. I'm yeah. gonna argue against the banana. Now here's the thing though. This is not necessarily Happy the point holidays. of view that Lauren and I have in real life. So for example, I'm going to argue against the banana, but who knows, maybe I'm actually super into the banana. Are in you really life. into the banana, Clara? I'm going to tell you that. They're going to have to try to figure it out. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I think realistically, I'm quite fraught over the banana. So this will be good. Well, let's just see who has a better poker face. Let's see if they can figure it oh, out. No, because I will always lose that. I have a face of many expressions. <laughs> Anyway, you guys can guess. And also, you know something else, guys, who are watching right now? Life and Times of in Lahona Rampton. You guys get to decide at the end of this who wins the Crit Clash, right? Oh, God. Right, right, right? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, let's just give a couple of pieces of information about this, because <laughs> maybe some of you guys did not read These about this. These comments are already so sassy. <laughs> but it's, it's basically, it's this piece called Comedian, and it's by a contemporary artist named Maurizio Catalan, and it was at the Art Basel Miami Beach exhibition, and it sold twice. It sold for $120,000, and for a second person bought it for $150,000. It actually sold three times. Oh, three the times. First, the first two were $120,000 each, and these are additions. So basically, this Additions. is like a new, banana, a new piece of tape every time. Then the third one sold for $150,000. This is not an addition. Give, come on. It, what is it, this? It's like Durer etching? This is it's not an addition. an addition. Anybody can make an addition. I'm going banana. Oh, my God. We're going to get so many bad puns with this. This is amazing. Well, we're going to have to try hard to keep up with these comments. So, I, Lauren, let's dig in. But we will get to your okay. comments. Sarah okay. Manuel and all you guys who are in there, I'd love they're, to they're hear from you. They're critiquing us so hard. They're doing better than we could do. <laughs> okay. So tell us in the chat if you are for or pro the banana. So Lauren, lay it out. Why are you for this piece of nothing? A piece of nothing? Yes. Well, okay. Let's see. My premise on this is not to say that the banana is like a super well executed diagonals all this like oh look at this guy oh my god this is um, the gallery owner my so this this is do, for, for background do people know what art basil is has anybody had experience or do you guys know about art fairs even if you know the uh well lauren give a primer just so people know a primer about art fairs well just because art fairs i think it's a very specific type of venue and it's yes. not the same thing as going to a gallery show or buying artwork somewhere yeah. else it's very particular you could think of going to a art fair kind of like going to either well two types of things one i think of the stock market like going on wall street and the other thing i think of is like you know that show shark tank where people have like these ideas and then they like, they have the people with lots of money that put money down on it. So in both cases, you're not trading with, you're, you're spending money, but you're not trading with 
for goods, you're trading for an idea of something, especially with the the Shark Tank kind of thing. There's nothing there. I mean, my feeling about art fairs is that it's just all about spectacle. It's yes, all about it, it totally drama is. and yes, exposure. And, and I feel that in some cases, it's really not about the artwork, well, actually. Well, so that's what I'm saying, is that like I think this banana is really great in rigging the system or in following the rules of the system, of the art world system as it is. Because in the art world, if you're going to these fairs, it's not about art. It's about or about how well the art is done. It's about investments. Like, really, if... If, if you're like people's idea of the art world and it, when people get really upset over this banana, their issue is or their underlying framework is that really good art deserves or like things that have labor put into it deserve a lot of money or like there's this tie between um, labor and money. But if that was really the case, would we have these janitors that work for Art Basel striking being like, this banana is worth more than us. So you're like, saying that's a good thing? <laughs> I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm saying that this banana is really good at highlighting in big yellow, like what these art fairs are actually about. Someone like actually, so one thing when I was reading up about this piece is there is like a certificate of authenticity that comes with it. You also and, have a manual for how to install the piece manual. that comes with the certificate of authenticity. Yeah, uh, yeah, on how to on how to put it together. As Lahona says, investments in being seen. So you are buying a certificate that shows, like it's basically like a, an art bond or a banana bond. Like you have this investment. And that piece of paper is what's worth the money, not the thing itself. And that manual is what's worth the money or not the thing itself. But don't so, you think as a piece of artwork, it shouldn't have to rely on being in a particular place to be effective? Like if you put this in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, then does it lose its meaning because it's not part of a spectacle anymore or because it's in the museum because it's a spectacle? Because to me, this is totally the emperor's new clothes. I oh. think Maurizio Catalan, the artist, is having the biggest laugh and he is laughing at all of us so hard right now. I think I think that he is, but like it did create a spectacle. Like now that's a moot point. There is a spectacle around this banana. It is true that banana didn't sell just once, it sold three times. And you can call those people like fools or whatever, but they, they, are part of what made that banana like rise up in addition to all the people around that have taken pictures with it, done their own like rendition of it. I think Popeyes did did one, like put put their burger beneath a, a piece of um, duct tape and then they sold it for $120,000, $120,000, $3.99 because the Popeye's chicken sandwich is $3.99. So like this thing got big, it got like memeable. And well, but what are we supposed to respect artwork because it got popular fast? Like it's a popularity contest. Like, oh well, wow, I look at all the exposure it got. Look at how many people saw this banana and duct tape. So therefore, wow, it must really be a great work of art because it reached people in this way. Well, I think that's that. Th then your critique is more on the people that made it really big, than on the artwork itself, because now it is popular, and now it has become a become a part of the culture. And what is artwork if not a reflection of the culture that it comes from? Yeah, but if you were Maurizio Catalan, the artist, would you feel proud of yourself for this? Would you feel creatively nourished and accomplished? That you did I, this I to would people? Feel, I would feel very proud of the reaction that it got. Like how Oh, so it's all it, about reaction. Well, if you're like a person, there are people that have gotten rich just making memes. Really, this guy is making like a, a, a physical meme. Like this is a meme. I know, but I don't think that that necessarily means that he's a brilliant artist. Like just because it made its way around the world via memes and social media. I mean, I, we're, we're looking here in the chat box. I just want to take a look at a couple pieces. Um, Ayodeshi saying it's a troll job. I know, this I is people making fun of too. art. And to be honest, it is really sad. So Ayodeshi is saying that it's, it's sort of upsetting for people that 
he's sort of um, taking what a lot of people regard as being a milestone of culture and society and turning it into a troll job. Like, I feel like that's really insulting in a lot this of is, ways. Well, this is the thing. It can be insulting, but the thing is that I really want to make clear is that these art markets, these, um, these art fairs, and these auctions are not about the art. It's not about art or get or art in the traditional sense of making something that looks very pretty or talented or laborious. It's about investments. And that is a different world than the art than our art world. This is a totally separate world. Well, so you're saying the banana duct tape lives in a different universe than the other artworks? Is that what you're saying? then yes, I think that there are different spheres of art world. And one of those spheres that kind of like my, like mimes the art world, but is really just about money is this art fair world. Yeah. But see, I think that that's incredibly um, exclusionary and elitist because it's like basically saying you have to be part of our rich people club to yeah. appreciate the absurdity of this. And yes. I think that's really upsetting and it offensive. Is upsetting. It is upsetting, but what we're critiquing here is like how well this artwork succeeds at what it's doing. It, it, it went up there for a specific purpose to create a scene, to have someone to buy it, to create the photo ops, to do this memeable thing. And maybe he's not brilliant, but he's good enough, this artist, to like read, or maybe he just got lucky. I mean, that's probably the bigger thing. This, 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 artwork for better or for worse uh fits the reaction of the times of what it, it, it it's it hits people's buttons and you know as well as i do that it is very very hard to grab people's attention for anything these days that is true i mean i think that people have very low attention spans now and there's a lot of stuff that is really brilliant that gets no exposure. People just don't see it. It's totally under the radar. It's like so, all those so, sleeper movies. Right. So basically what we have to think about here, like in this argument, is what are our values like below this that are creating the opinions that we have about this piece? Like clearly it sounds like you have a value or I probably have a value too that brilliance should be linked with exposure. People that are really smart should have exposure or get exposure or people that work really hard should get a lot of money or get a lot of money. Now, we can have these va values, but they aren't necessarily what exists in the real world or this bananas world or, you know, whatever. Let's go into the chat. Let's see. Aideshi saying artwork price is based on popularity of the artist and the place and not the artwork itself. Yes, Lahona exactly. is saying it's a startle factor. Yep. And yep. Life and Times is saying the tape could be a significant message, meaning we're trapped in the society. And Alice Shapiro is saying, actually, bankers advise trust to think of art as a financial item to invest in, not as an object. Yeah. All of these are great comments. This is, And you go up further. There's a lot more further up. Uh, Lahona brought up uh, Marcel Duchamp, who did The Toilet, who got a similar reaction. You know, Actually, if we're thinking about the future... It is hard for me to see, even though the banana made like a huge reaction, huge splash and got people to spend a lot of money on it. It's hard for me to see it having the staying power. So staying power and attention are two different things. Mm -hmm. And like you were talking about museums. And so Marcel Duchamp has, um, I'm going to call it an advantage over this banana. One, because he did it first. He did the ready-made first. He he was like the first troll, so that does get that does have some place in in notoriety. Also, that his object is um, not perishable. It's hard for me to see <laughs> someone taking. Actually, what is offensive to me about the piece mostly is taking um, perishable objects, uh, specifically a banana, which like takes a lot of gas energy to like transport it's food that someone could eat it's like basically like wasting it and this would have to if this was a museum setting it would be, have to be replaced every two days this is what is like listed in the manual 
But that's not uncommon. I mean, there's a lot of artworks that are like that, that have high maintenance to actually keep on display. Right. So right. that that's not something that I think is anything new. But I think what we're trying to distinguish here is, is the artwork, the spreading of the image, because Lahona brought up Kusama and yeah. her infinity mirrors. And actually, yeah. I saw the piece that she just had at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston a few weeks ago. And it was sort of cool. But you know what I was really shocked by is that when you go into the infinity room, literally, I'm not exaggerating. You were in there for about two minutes. That's it. Yeah. So yeah. you're in there, you take your photos, and then you leave. And I felt so dirty after that experience. And I paid $15 it's to like stand in a room for two minutes. Yeah. I mean, I was furious after that. I mean, you're basically paying for, I also saw the infinity room when it was in New York, um, uh, you know, in Chelsea. And it was the same experience. There was a long line. We waited in the cold. You got two minutes. There was a gallery attendant that told you when your time was up. Um, it was really so you could get like the photo experience of being in there. Although it it did really, that part made me feel bad, like not very good, but I, I got more, I, I felt like I got a lot of that piece or it made me think a lot afterwards about how it was made, about how small I felt in that room, about um, how like both, I mean, like I kind of have a bias or like a jump start on that because I have a previous or I've, I've read about uh, Yoyu Kusama's previous history and what she's doing with a lot of these things now. Um, she's got a history of doing lots of pattern, repetitive, infinity type things. So um, I thought that, I think that that experience, yes, has a dirtiness over it, but there was still some value, there was still some crunchiness to it that I did get. I mean, I'm not saying I didn't get anything out of the experience. I mean, it was sort of fun, but I remember because I was with my daughter who happens to love polka dots. We got in there and I was like, okay, got to take my photos as quickly as possible. Like I did yeah, not yeah. just experience it. And that I really had a problem with. And it's like looking yeah. at photos like this, it just makes me ill. Like this is not about an artistic experience. People aren't really thinking about the work. But, okay, it's just so, spectacle. So That's all it is. Yes. I mean, let's let's keep talking about that, too. Um, also, Elsa just came in. Um, thanks for tuning in. And uh, I'd love to hear, like, why it, um, what, what symbolism you get out of it, because I feel like you're of the the minority in this as far as, like, the reactions to this piece, maybe. Yeah, but see, um, Lauren, do you notice that Elsa is the first person in the chat who has actually talked about the artwork itself. This entire yeah, conversation you know. well, has so been about exposure and popularity and money. And like, as an artist, that yeah. just makes me ill. <laughs> like, I, I know it's because you're a very traditional artist, Clara. No, remember, you're, I'm you're... arguing con, not because I necessarily believe it, but I'm arguing the con I, side. Yes, you're arguing con. That's very hard because I just want to get into like... No, no, no. You are pro. You got to remember, you're pro banana. <laughs> I am pro banana. I'm not saying anything bad about the banana. I'm saying that there's like just some really interesting politics around this. Like the artwork, I think there are more things to this too that this is like revealing for us. One, uh, the like when we're making artwork, is it ever just about the artwork? Like what context does your artwork exist in? Clearly this artwork artwork only can exist in a fair like this type of thing. Imagine someone trying to sell this banana on the street. Or why is it that this banana with duct tape sells over anybody else's duct tape banana? Like what is the context of this that can create this? And then also um, I want everybody to think about when they're especially especially if somebody has social media, especially like Instagram, and they're creating an artwork, how invested or what is their intention with the product or how do you feel when you are, when you are sharing that product? Like, do you, is like, I feel like for a lot of artists these days, posting things say to like Instagram or having that photo available to share is woven into a lot of artists 
making these days. It, it is, but here here's another thing. Let's let's pull in somebody who, in my opinion, is the total opposite end of the spectrum, the extreme contrast versus the duct tape. So I, I want to talk about two artists. Sure. The first artist would be Norman Rockwell. And the second artist is Amy Sherald, who painted the Michelle Obama portrait. And okay. so to me, in a lot of ways, Amy Sherald is like our version of what Norman Rockwell was many decades sure. ago. Now, a lot of this is about context. I'm not saying Amy Sherald is Norman Rockwell or vice versa, but her image that she did of Michelle Obama has a place in history now that has been secured yeah. that will always be there forever. And it's the same thing with Norman Rockwell. Like for example, he's the artist who painted this iconic painting, The Problem We All Live With, which if you don't know the history, this is an image of the six-year-old girl Ruby Bridges who was going to a school and had yeah. to be um, surrounded by US Marshals, be accompanied because of the harassment that she was getting because of the color of her skin. And it's like, think about somebody like Norman Rockwell, okay? Here's a guy, did everything himself, okay? He, nobody painted his things for him. He was responsible for every single stroke. And actually, this is very funny because I went to the Norman Rockwell Museum last week and I have always loved Norman Rockwell, okay? That, that is not new, this is real Professor Lou. <laughs> but, but the thing about his paintings that I thought was astounding is that these were paintings that were done for the covers of the Saturday Evening Post. And at the museum, the whole bottom floor, it's like walls of Saturday Evening Post covers. Like you cannot believe how many he did. And it's like every single one of these paintings was like a masterpiece. And yeah. I just thought to myself, you know something? This image of Ruby Bridges, this lives on no matter where it is. It could be in a magazine, it could be in a museum, it could be accompanying an article. It still has that power. I mean, can you guys really say, looking at Catalan's piece, that we can equate the same type of weight? I mean, I'm not well, saying they're the same thing. I'm just saying that to me, it's sort of insulting that this could get that kind of spectacle and people say, wow, isn't it so amazing? And look at the absurdity and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, we have people like Amy Sherald who are doing iconic imagery, which is gonna sustain us for centuries. It's so I, hard for me to contrast those two things. I think that the, the, uh, the Life and Times here uh, has a comment here in the chat, uh, says uh, the art piece highlights the times of this current era. It doesn't have to be artistically refined to make an impact. And I think that again is kind of what it comes down to. Like, I think Norman Rockwell is incredibly, like he is of his time. Like when I think of like real Americana, I think of Norman Rockwell. Like he was part of like this 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 time period that was really um, uh, like really symbolic and like really considered like a, a good time for for America, at least um, especially like certain segments of America. Um, it's uh, he he was one of the people that that created like the American image. Uh, but we are not in that time anymore. We're in a time when um, we've, we've gone through things like in the art world, talking about like painting is dead, illustration is dead, you know, we have the internet now, we, we're in a much more cynical time and maybe a cynical piece is appropriate for a cynical time. Well, I could see that point that obviously all of art that's created is an inherent reaction to the time period. You can't be an artist and make something and not have it relate somehow to your contemporary life and experience. But the thing is, I, I just can't see how this type of thing can really fly. Because to me, this is really not art. This is just a publicity you're, you're stunt. You're from an earlier time, Clara. You're old. I'm not old. You're I'm not old. Hey, I'm like, 
I'm not double your age. I can say that at least. I, I'm, I'm just double the age of my current once, students. Once That's you awesome. were double my age. <laughs> at one point, yes, exactly. When, when I was a student, you were double my age. I guess what I'm trying to say is that as somebody who has studied art history through and through, and I, I've seen a lot of different things, like for example, let's go back to the other side of the spectrum. And I don't know if some of you guys have seen, there's this piece by the British artist, Martin Creed. So this was called The Lights Going On and Off. It was made in 2000. This is before Instagram, okay? And this piece was notorious because it won the Turner Prize, which is a very prestigious prize that they give in Britain. It was acquired by Tate Britain. And basically it's an empty room. The lights are on for five seconds and then they turn off and then they turn back on. Is this really? A is Martin Creed proud of this? Is he? I just cannot see that. To me, it's such a load oh, of garbage. Oh, oh. Iodeji says I'm convincing him to be pro banana. What? No, <laughs> no. Okay, okay. I got to step on my game. Okay, here's the thing. When we go back and we look at these Rockwell images, okay, I'm not just talking about the making of the object. Okay, so let, let's just step aside from the making part and let's okay. talk about Norman Rockwell's reach, okay? Because here's the thing, back when magazines had a real impact, okay, and people actually subscribed to magazines, like being on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post, that was a really big deal. Like that was what everybody looked at because there was no other option. You couldn't go up and look at it online. Yeah. So think about the reach of Norman Rockwell doing all of these Saturday Evening Post magazines. Think about how many lives his artwork touched. And not because, oh, look at how funny and ironic that was, but because it really had meaning. Like this is an image, Rosie the Riveter, which is very iconic. And it had to do with the war and about all the women. And it was a commentary. And, you know, the thing about um, Norman Rockwell is he did really sort of fun pieces like this, which is a triple cell portrait. So he had pieces that were very personal, but it's like you look at this piece, which is freedom of worship and then going back to ruby bridges i mean think about where and how this piece has impacted so many lives and the commentary on this is really incredible i mean to me as an artist i would take that every day over this big spectacle because to me i just feel gross i i think that you are you are bringing out something that is also very important. Like, I think that your opinion is valid and valuable here, your argument is. And I also want to tie it with something that Lahona said, where, or two things, where she said, shallow times deserve shallow art comment, but then as in the ba banana, not you guys. And that <laughs> makes me think about how, even though, so there, there is, you can have an entire, say, like, cynical culture, cynical art culture, cynical artwork. But we have to remember that we are not a monoculture. The art world is not like a monoculture. Like there can be groups of people like you or like, I guess, Norman Rockwell or like any of us on here that really wish that there were things that have values that are, I'm gonna say higher than a banana. Like those, just because the banana exists and is very popular does not um, devalue your own uh, place in the art world or your own values in the art world. And that's something that I really love about being a painter is that there is a place for the kind of work that I value and the kind of work that I want to do or like seeing other people do and I can still choose to operate within that. So you can still choose to operate in your, like, Norman Rockwell, like, <laughs> good feeling, good vibes, kind of. Norman um, Rockwell is not all about good vibes. I mean. And he's, he's not, he's not, but he's really American dream, like, apple pie. He, like, he's, he's not, though. I mean, look at this image of Ruby Bridges. I mean, do you I, guys I, see I, the tomato and how initially, if you look at this, you see it as blood? But then you realize it's tomato and but, then things shift and change like this is an image you want to stay with like i have seen this image so many times okay i'm looking at it right now and i am seeing things i have never seen before 
And the thing is, that's what I think a great work of art does, is that you can engage with it repeatedly and always find something different. I am going back to the Catalan piece and I don't need to look at this again. Like I see it once, I get it, that's it. Okay, then I start Except thinking, we, oh, we, absurdity. We've gone for 31 minutes about all the different topics that this banana brings up. So it's clearly not nothing. Well, I think that if we put that against Ruby Bridges, Ruby Bridges has a lot more Ruby going Bridges on. Ruby Bridges can still be your favorite piece, that's okay. I, I just, I don't know. I think it's really upsetting that that would be considered or, or like even put in the same remote world. Like and I see that there are different parts of the art world, but I don't think that it's remotely on the same. Okay. Like to me, it's like you can't even compare them because it's like Norman Rockwell is such a like American icon and treasure. Right. And it's like, think about this piece with Michelle Obama. Okay. You guys know that photo that went viral of the little girl who was um, looking at the photo of Obama. And it's like, you think about like what that means for a little girl who is African-American to see a portrait of Michelle Obama in the National Portrait Gallery. That is groundbreaking as an artwork. That, that has so much meaning and depth to it that I'm sorry, your banana just doesn't have. So, I'm going to take another tactic here. Like, yes, I think that, again, I don't think that the banana erases the powerful work of Amy Sherald um, and the Michelle Obama portrait. I don't think that at all. Um, but one thing that you said is you felt very uncomfortable or like upset by this banana. And one thing that you told me when I was in your class a long time ago is to lean into things that made me upset because that oh, means crap that, this is my teaching coming back yeah, to haunt me it means that there's something there the worst thing that you can possibly do is like have a mediocre reaction to a work of art to just like flip through it to not notice it so, so being invisible is worse be invisible. than be having invisible. a bad reaction yeah so if you're having a reaction it means that there's something there that this banana is setting off in you that you need to think about we're going to treat this like therapy here and this banana is the instigator of that values therapy that we need to do together but the thing is like how is this any different than your average just junky video of oh let's do something really stupid to get a reaction like did you guys see that viral video it was viewed by like 10 million people it was some guy making like this big thing of foam explode in a pool and i all i could think watching that video was who's gonna clean that up and what a waste like think about how much money it must have taken to pull up that stunt like and what you could do with that money instead like that's sort of offensive for a lot of people it 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 is <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not going to argue with you. It is, but this is, that still doesn't erase that like these things and this kind of culture for these things exists. Like if there was not a need for this be banana, like we would not be hearing about it. So like, I'm, and I don't even mean like a need for us. Okay. Like I don't even mean like a need for us. I'm talking about like some kind of stupid cultural need. We really need this banana right now. I don't Do know we? why. I did not need this banana. I really did not. It was in all my social media feeds and every single time I just was like, really, really then, guys. Then why are we critiquing the banana right now? <sighs> Crap. <laughs> why? Cause you chose the banana, not me. Oh, oh, but why did I choose the banana? Why did you choose the banana? Because I knew it was going to get a reaction. So, Correct. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> because how could this not get a reaction? This is, this is getting very meta now, I feel like. It is getting very, but, but I, I think I we think need to go should, here, I Lauren. I read some of the comments here. They've just been like going and going. These people have been very um, helpful in this critique. Well, so let's go in here because Elsa Grace is saying... Real jewelry, cheapo costume jewelry, both exist for different purposes, though the common purpose is to decorate a person. Oh, that's very interesting because it, it is sort of the same, I don't, I wouldn't even say intent, but they exist for similar reasons and that it, it's like yeah. an artwork, a visual experience or something like that. Spoiler alert. Well, not spoiler. I only wear costume jewelry. If it, 
It, it just has to look blingy. It doesn't have to actually be blingy, guys. Well, so, but here, here's an example, okay? So we are here talking about this banana and duct tape. Yeah. If I did a stream and I said, we're going to talk about Norman Rockwell today, how many people do you think would be in that chat going on and on and on about all of that stuff? I suspect that probably the chat would be a little slower. Well, little again, quieter. because Norman Rockwell is not of this time period anymore. The banana is of this time period. Well, say a contemporary version of Norm. Let's say Amy Sherald. Okay, let's say I do a stream about Amy Sherald's Obama portrait. What would the chat box be like then? I, you know, I don't know. I think... Maybe we I have still, to do it. <laughs> I think I think we have to do it. I would be very sad if it didn't get the same level of uh, response, but I have like a feeling in my head that it, it, it probably wouldn't. And Well, see, I that upsets me though, that you yeah. could say, here's a live stream about the banana. Here's a live stream about Michelle Obama's portrait. And between the two, the Michelle Obama portrait is not nearly going to get the type of lively discussion and engagement that we're getting. Again, it's because it's because the banana flips a certain switch of like, you know, you could say it's because we're really into like, um, what's it like hate watching things. Mm -hmm. We we like clickbait kinds of things. We like things that we know are going to piss us off. It's it's a simple image to look at. It's not difficult to parse out because there's you know, not a whole lot there to parse out. I know you guys are trying really, really hard to critique the actual banana, and I really appreciate <laughs> it. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, yeah, and Lahona brings up, I mean, like, actually, uh, you know, I feel like both of these artists, uh, Amy Sherald is really well known, like, in the painting world, but probably not in the general population. I feel like same with this guy up until he posted that banana. Like, our... Art Basel is a very like high end thing with lots of press. So uh, this kind of found the right way in at the right time. But also that's what sort of makes me really not like art fairs because they feel so um, much about like the rich kids club. Like, like you have to be one of us to be part of this. And I just yeah. have real problems with that. Um, I mean, you're right. Uh, but actually, while we are on that topic, I do want to say not not all art fairs are are like this. Most not of all of them are, are, but the Basel one is. Yeah, the the art Basel one is. Uh, there are some real like skeezy ones that I'm not into. There there are some ones that have been created in reaction to this, but I'm going to call like more um, uh, more of your type, Clara. Of, oh, of, oh, my type. Oh. Rockwell type that really like values like uh, the heart and soul of art um, uh, art fairs that that promote um, like emerging artists or um, art fairs that like deal with like a certain genre of like you know painting or like installation or artwork or like art fairs that try to make visible uh, like women and people of color and artists that don't usually get a lot of like support in the art world. So there are, there are good art fairs that are doing good things. I'm sure there are, but nobody really hears about them. Not the way that they do about Art Basel. I mean, actually let's go into the chat because, oh no, Ayodeshi is extremely pro banana after the stream. Think, no, 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 no. You are like hating, you are hating on this banana so much. I, like, I'm so upset about this. Like, how can, how can my former student be beating me in a crit clash? This is not good. I'm losing my touch, Lauren. Okay, I'm going to whip out, I'm going to whip out the, the arsenal now. Because it's, it's, it's because I'm a millennial and I am all about cynicism. That's like my middle name is millennial. Oh, you don't think I'm cynical? I can be cynical, Laura. <laughs> no, not, not the way that someone of my generation can. We're so cynical that like we don't even do anything anymore because the world is hopeless. Oh, well, I hope you guys are really proud of yourselves for what you've accomplished as millennials that could thank care you, less about you. anybody but themselves. Um. <laughs> Hang on. So we have a few new people here too. Oh, cool. Uh, Dryad thinks it's a version of um, Emperor's New Clothes. Exactly. 
exactly. I got you, Dryad. That's it. But again, like the thing about the Emperor's New Clothes, the reason that story is so good is because you get to like what? Like it's a social critique. It's a social critique. I mean, like, <laughs> du Duchamp's piece, wasn't that a social critique, really? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble getting my composure. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, Dorinka saying, interesting how the tape's length is the same in both sides, left and right side of the banana. It's, it's very, oh. at least it's well executed, guys. Oh, it is not well executed. Come on! First of all, if you want to put a banana somewhere, why are you using duct tape? Duct tape is like the worst tape in the world. It ruins everything. Like... Okay. I, it's it's not about the piece. We got a comment here from Maria or Mariah who says, I honestly thought the banana thing was really stupid, but then I read a lot of people's thoughts on the piece and started to understand why it went so viral and appreciate the idea behind it. Yeah, but and doesn't so, so that bother you that you need someone else to explain to you why it's a good piece? Like, shouldn't an artwork be able to stand on its own and I reach you to, as a person? That. I used to think that until... I, I thought that when I was younger, when I was like in, when I was making individual pieces of artwork, but then I started thinking about, um, I started reading John Berger or Berger, um, who's like, you know, he's very accessible art theory, I'm going to say. Like, he, he writes very beautifully. That's like an and oxymoron, Lauren. <laughs> accessible I, art I theory know. writing. But, he, he he writes about artwork and or like he writes about images and the context of images and it may and also with like my thinking about color and how color only exists like within a context of other colors like contrasts of things I think the context is really important for anything like you can't divorce this from you know the rest of the world yeah but like, I don't think it's okay to say like this artwork is only effective under these conditions. That's but isn't, stupid. But isn't that like anything? Like no, I, I think that you can have images, like going back to the Norman Rockwell image, it's like, I don't have to be in Miami Beach, Florida to understand this piece. I also don't need anyone to explain to me why this is a riveting, incredible piece of artwork. Okay. If, if you were, if you were, in, if you found that piece in a thrift shop in, you know, like somewhere in rural Russia or mm -hmm. something, and you grew up there, and you didn't have any knowledge of the U.S., and you saw that piece, would are you telling me you would really get the same impression of it? You found it in a thrift shop in a bin. You just found this image there. Well, it wouldn't read the same way because obviously if it's not in the Smithsonian, you're going to read it differently, but this, I can still look at it and engage is, with it I'm, as an image. Uh, you you could, but you're not, you're definitely not going to have the same reaction. You might not even pick it up. You would only look at it for a second. You're certainly not going to remember it the same way. The reason this image stays with you is because you know the history of the U.S. You know about, you know, our issues with like treating black people in the u.s you know about uh norman rockwell you probably saw this image in art history and then you saw it in a museum all of these things affect how you're going to read that image yeah but it's the same with the banana like what am i gonna go to the grocery store and look at the banana and say oh my goodness the absurdity of the world is coming down like that it, it's the same that thing that's what I'm saying is that this piece exists in, or the banana piece exists in a specific location at a specific time, like around specific people. And that is what has created the sensation. Yeah, and except that Norman Rockwell's work banana. went everywhere. It was in magazines. It was in... It, it did not ha it did not just stay in that one place. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm saying well, that I mean, artwork is in many different places, but Norman Rockwell's work had a reach and a depth that that freaking banana is never going to have. You, are you sure though? Because the banana has now like gone across the entire internet all over the world, and so it, did the Black it, Plague. I mean, it, like the and, Black and Plague spreading done, wasn't a good people thing. People have done riffs on top of it, and then on top of that, that's I, what I find 
like beautiful actually about meme culture is you can start with an original image. Like say, I'm sure you guys know about like that cat sitting at the dinner table that looks irritated and the two women like yelling at the cat. Clara, I'm sure even you've seen this. I haven't. Oh my God. <laughs> it's just been everywhere. And it's it's been like, it's been so pervasive that people have done like memes off of that meme and then have done memes off of the meme off of the meme. It's like, I think it's really wonderful because it shows like how, it both shows how ideas like, you know, move around in our society, but it also shows like how language develops and how like pictorial language develops. And like Rockwell did the same thing and I'm not discounting him again, I really love Rockwell. But what I'm saying is that this banana reflects some of that in more contemporary ways. But don't you find that incredibly depressing that we have this artwork about how absurd and financially driven and how everything's a popularity contest? I mean, is that just not like the most depressing thing you've heard I mean, of? I can, I can be, de be depressed by something, but also acknowledge and appreciate the logic at the same time. I just find, because it's like Maurizio Canlan, like, he does not really believe in this. He, he's just pulling a stunt. Like, the, to me, this is, there, there's so little of a line between this and just pulling a prank. Like, I, what I is can, the difference I, between this and like, a prank? I can talk about other things that started out as pranks or started out as a publicity stunt that turned into real things. So actually, we're going to look at a few examples, but before we move on and continue our crit clash, I want to tell you guys, if you did not know, we are having a portfolio critique marathon, January 18th. Guys, I'm going to stay up till 4 a.m. and we're going to be on YouTube for eight hours. Oh my God, I'm so excited. I'm so it. excited. And we're, it's going to be like portfolio critique pajama party. It's going to be the best thing. And we're going to critique your portfolios. I'm critiquing from like 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. or something <laughs> like that. And also it's my birthday. So you guys should tune in. Exactly. Just for that yeah. reason alone. But basically, if you want your portfolio critiqued and you want priority, I would advise that you go over to our Patreon and you pledge at least $2. If you pledge $2 by tonight, $11.59, you will be at the top of the queue, okay? Now, you can submit later. Like, after tonight, you can give a one-time donation. You can also um, give it to us live during the marathon. You can just give us a super chat and just send us the link and we can do that. But, of course, if you do it tonight you're way more likely to be in the actual marathon. The longer you guys wait, the less likeliness that you're actually going to get a slot. And so if you want to get a critique, guys, submit to this, okay? Just pledge $2 on Patreon, and then you have until January 13th to send us your portfolio. So the important thing today, you just got to pledge that $2. And if you're already a Patreon supporter, just bump up $2, and that will get you into the marathon, okay? So we're super stoked about this. But I'd encourage you guys, because we do offer portfolio critiques that you can purchase, but let's just say we don't charge $2. $2. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit more than $2. So here is your shot. And I would advise you guys, get in on this, because this is a great opportunity. We are so stoked about this. So definitely submit. And if you have questions, just go to artprof.org on the front page. We have all the information, submission stuff and everything. You should be able to find everything there. Okay, cool. Okay. Let's go on to a couple of the other pieces that I wanted to bring up, which Wait, was this Alice Richard... Alice asking me if everybody can be an artist. And what's our response for that on Art Prof? I think everybody can be an artist. I don't think being an artist is something you need to ask permission to be. Don't you? Like, I, I, there, are different, there, there are different types of, I'm going to call them like... Uh, like skills unlocks or level unlocks that you can do within your own art world thing. Um, but obviously anybody can go out there and I guess not obviously because some people think they can't be an artist. You can just, you can, um, you know, start learning on your own or go to school or like talk to other artists and that automatically starts you on becoming an artist. That's fine. I mean, I, th this is the real Professor Lou. Okay, this is not con Professor Lou. <laughs> Basically, what I would say, Alice, I think anybody can be an artist, really. And I, I just don't think that it has to be this formal, I'm an artist. I'm not an artist. I'm trying to be an artist. Like, there's no, like, 
stages of that. It's it's just whoever you want to be, it is your place to do that. I understand that there are some people who say, oh, well, I don't feel I have the skill set or maybe I don't have the experience or anything. I mean, that's so specific to the individual person. But I have personally always believed that you can be an artist. I don't think that everybody is inherently an artist. Like that right. whole like, oh, when you're born, you're an artist. I don't think that's true. Oh, I, I hate that. I hate that. Yeah, that's don't not people true. People say that you're born with talent. No, no. Like no. you can decide to become an artist. Anybody has the right um, and the ability to make that decision. But then to continue to be like an artist, you have to then like dedicate some time to you know, that, that profession or that side of you. I mean, to me, being an artist is about having an initiative, like a, a motivation, a reason to want to create something. That's all you need. You, you don't need anything beyond that. That's always been my thought. Okay, so let's put on our pro and con hats now. Lauren. Okay. I okay. want to talk about Karen Liu's comment because she said, is it absurd that some king can hire a portrait artist to make himself look good? Doesn't mean the portrait has to be poorly executed. You know something, Karen? Velazquez. Poor guy had to paint King Philip IV over and over and over again. <laughs> and King Philip IV was not a good looking guy. Like he's weird looking. Like guys right now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, look up Velazquez King Philip IV and you will see what I'm talking about. Okay. So there's a long tradition of many, many artists having to do that over and over again. <laughs> This is great. I'm sorry we're not getting to every single comment, you guys, you guys but we are trying to get there. Prolific tonight. It's really awesome. It's very exciting, guys. This is really fun. Let's see. Lahona's saying there's a difference between art and craft. Craft is skill. Art has risk. Oh, whoa, Lahona, we got another stream idea there because <laughs> that's a hornet's nest yeah. that we're going to have to wade into at this some is, point. This is a thing, and this, I think, comes back to the banana, although I'm going to say the banana is not the best example of this, but I think when artists are starting out and when lay people or people who are not artists are looking at artwork in museums, they value or they, they look for the technique, the craft first, like the physical making of the thing. They want to see something that is well done. That is perfectly acceptable. That is perfectly fine. You're not going to find in this banana unless you love the way the duct tape was laid out. That is some real fine duct tape. <laughs> but like Norman Rockwell is a great example of that because he has a lot of like chops that you can see a lot of real good skills. Um, but then you come to this other thing that, you know, as you're practicing as an artist, or as you're like, really wondering why so many squares are in museums, like paintings of squares, or like maybe you saw like some performance. Oh, Tilda reading. Swinton. Let's talk about her. Tilda Swinton? You didn't hear about this piece? No. Oh, okay. I mean, so this is a piece, Tilda Swinton. If you don't know her, she's been in a lot of movies. She's like a capital A, you know, Hollywood I, star. She is. I just didn't know. So she did this piece where she basically slept in a glass box at MoMA. That was the piece. Another spectacle. Because who doesn't want to go see Tilda Swinton, you know? I would love to see Tilda Swinton. I Actually, mean, I have heard that she's incredibly nice because somebody I know worked on a movie with her and said she's so nice, which is funny because she's so creepy on screen. <laughs> she is like my hero. Oh, like, I, I love her. She's like, like creepy. Alien, just like her. She's like a creepy version of Kate Planchett, who I also love. <laughs> but OK, so here we have a thing, right? It's like so what I was going to say is it's like that other like realm of like expertise is in content and content is really hard. It really trips people up. I think it's um, harder to understand. Mm, oh, Fastbender sleeping at the moment. I'm so distracted by Leon. <laughs> Sorry. You, you need to like, you need to take a chill pill. No, you, you know what's wrong? I watched Jane Eyre last night and now I can't focus. You get so distracted by hot movie men. This it's is ridiculous. terrible because you know something, Lauren? Now our users are turning into my students who like bother me in class. Like this is what my pre-college kids did to me I, all I summer. I know. I mean, you're the one that puts that stuff out there. I did not. Julie, my TA told them. I did not tell them this. She leaked it. 
So <laughs> she didn't leak it. It's, it's public information. Well, it's public information now. It wasn't at the time. Okay. So anyway, let's get back to Tilda Swinton. So here's the thing. Like, this is another piece. There, there's no technique at all. She just climbed into a box and started sleeping. And here we're just voyeurs. It's just like, oh, look at Tilda Swinton. She's just this object that we're like looking at. And I mean, that's just like what we do with her on TV. I don't think that's the same thing, though. I mean, th this is just her. I mean, or I don't know. You, I guess you could argue that she's objectifying herself willingly. Like, maybe that's... I mean, in fact, even with, with movies, we, we, like, pay money to consume Tilda Swinton. I don't think it's I the same thing, though, because she's turning herself doing. into an object in a museum. Like, in a movie, that's, like, an interactive experience. I mean, it is interactive here. She's just sleeping. She's present. She's there. I know, but she's objectifying herself because she's not doing it. She's no interaction. You know what I'm saying? Like she's, and the thing is, it's a glass case. You know, like she's putting herself like in the fishbowl for people to look at. So that's. There's, I think that there's a long history of performance artists that have done similar things. Like um, I think of, what is it? Is it Maria Abramovic, who I don't yeah. necessarily love, but she did that whole thing with the artist is present, I think it was called. And everybody paid to go and like sit in front of her for like two minutes. And it was like part like the spectacle of being having access to this really famous artist right in front of you. And again, like consuming this artist like as an object. But that was also an act of endurance because it's incredibly hard to sit in a chair like that for like 10 hours without moving. Well, and here's think... another piece that I want to bring up, which is this piece from 1998 by the British artist Tracy Emin. And this piece is called My Bet. So let me give you guys a little bit of context on this. So basically, people were outraged about this piece for similar reasons, because again, it was sold for an absurd amount of money. But also, it has like actual bodily secretions in it. And there are like used condoms and all kinds of really unpleasant <laughs> objects. And it's all real. And so people were very, very alarmed about this situation. And so here we don't have the person. The artist is not present. Yeah. But in some ways, I have to say, I find this almost more powerful for that reason, because it's almost like this is the, the trace of the person. Yes. And so yeah. I feel like I understand why people were upset about this piece. But to me, this is way better than Tilda Swinton's piece. I feel like Tilda Swinton this because she knew she could. You know, like if I went to MoMA and said, hey, I want to sleep in a glass box, like nobody would care. It's just because she's Tilda Swinton. It's a celebrity thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. And again, I think it's like these are different powerful spheres of the art world that um, are getting real fuzzy because some things there, like, yeah, I think that bed is like very powerful too. There's a lot, again, about like, yeah, in endurance or leaving a mark or like you know, the, like, the life of some person, both involve, like, this kind of voyeuristic thing, but, like, one was maybe done with, like, this, some kind of set out, like, performative intention, and then the other could have been, and we don't know, because Tilda Swinton does make art, but it could have been Tilda Swinton going in and saying, like, hey, Momo, will you let me, like, sleep in a box? But, <laughs> know, like, these tell. things are put at the same level here because... Well, you know, both have access to people within the museum system that um, were like, hey, I like you. Like, yes, you can do this. But see, again, that's where the banana duct tape really makes me mad because, again, it's about rich people talking to yeah. other rich people, selling yep. art to other rich people. And yep. just as an artwork, that just sort of makes me sick. I mean, think about what you could do with one hundred fifty thousand dollars. I mean, that's enough to feed several families for a Again, while. Again, okay, so I'm not I'm not saying the banana is good, and that was not I'm I'm pro banana, but I I want to make a differentiation between being pro banana and saying that the banana is a good thing. I think that there are two different things here, but I do think something that was interesting about this banana piece is that it sparked a janitors' union in Miami to go on strike because they like the amount that this banana uh, sold for was like, like many times over what the annual salary is or the hourly wage over a year 
for the janitors that then have to clean up after this banana at the fair, like mm -hmm. at the art fair. So I think also what's interesting about this going more again into the, the, the social commentary, public commentary route is that there are, it, it, it brings to light some of these disgusting things in ways that are really sharp and clear. And it, you know, it's, it's gross that it does this, but it's an opportunity to then talk about those things in a way that sometimes it's a little bit more fuzzy and hard to quantify without having such a like, uh, really without having such an absurdity come to light. Again, I'm not saying that is good, <laughs> but it's just like the way the world works where it requires like some kind of like crazy, like huge um, thing that makes people mad in order to get people to like take action on something or to contribute to something, contribute to an action. All right. So you guys sense? in the chat, tell us who won this crit clash. Oh my God. Did I win or did Lauren win? And while uh -huh. you guys put in your votes, I'm going to tell you that if you would like to purchase a portfolio critique or a Skype session or an artist website critique, we do offer lots of mentoring. Get into that chat. Tell me who won. Who won this crit clash? Or just, you know what? Beyond that, you guys should just um, rate your own. If you're for or against banana. the banana or just what's your for, uh, sort of conclusion about the banana? Yeah. Do you hate it but love it at the same time? Because that's sort of how I feel actually in real life. Oh. Part of me feels absolutely disgusted by the whole thing but then i also think what's up catalan you're freaking brilliant you're awesome you're laughing at the whole world and i love it that's real professor lou okay that's what? not con professor lou <laughs> what I'm lauren what no no no, no! no! i don't you, like Daddy. this i don't like this thing where my students my outperform me my former students lauren's an old student i'm, um, I'm an old student i i do Okay, I'm gonna. I'll, oh, I'll Jason you. is saying you both lost in the banana one. No. Ow. Oh. Ouch! Oh, that that's, hurts me, Jason. That's great. That is that's oh that's God. the true answer right there. Thank you so Thank much you. to our top supporters: Johnny Mac, Lahona Rampton, Ross Hines, Tammy Dreiger, and Sally Webster. Keep going in there, guys. Get into that chat. Tell me who won this crit clash because oh, I'm getting I, the vote. Oh, oh, someone vote for Clara. Ooh, 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 no, no, no. I, I'm, I'm catching up to you. I'm, I'm getting, I, okay. Look, look, Dryad's <laughs> with me. So is Life and Times. Okay, guys, the, this is kind of close now. We need to hear from more people. And Windows Zombie saying, I get the banana context. It says Lauren said, but at the same time, I think it's ridiculous. I'm going to yeah. reveal my true opinion here, guys. I also think the banana is ridiculous. I appreciate that performance and spectacle art can exist and that these different waves of like social interactions happen. But like, I am, I am with Clara in that it's, it's a little bit sickening that this is where we're at to get like a mm -hmm. kind of response in the world. I mean, it's really hard not to ignore something like this. You can't discredit somebody taking a freaking banana and making it travel across the world. I mean, I don't know that a lot of people could pull that off. It's, and it's amazing that it happened. It's amazing it happened. Also think about what did Maurizio Catalan have to do to line up the circumstances to actually facilitate something yeah. like this? You yeah. know, you can't just be like, if I went and said, oh, I'm going to do that, nobody would care. Okay. Maurizio Catalan was the guy actually who brought the golden toilet and then didn't it get stolen? I didn't do a lot of reading on this. But anyway, oh, you guys, the banana one. Oh, my God, Lauren, banana we're so one. lame. The artwork conquered us. <laughs> Let's see, Maria's saying, I appreciate the idea, but I don't consider the actual piece a work of art. You know, I sort of agree with that. I, I don't really think about it as like a work of art. I think it's like a spectacle. Like that's Well, I, I think we need to do a talk on... Um... Well, I don't know how many people actually come to this talk, but uh, maybe a stream about um, artworks that don't necessarily involve a product. Oh, yeah. No, for sure. We've got a million yeah. things that we need to talk about. But if you guys would like to become a top supporter, like these lovely people who keep the lights on here at ArtProf, go to artprof.org, go to Patreon, because 
all of our Patreon supporters, on top of the rewards you guys get, you also get automatically entered into a Patreon monthly giveaway. And we have so many goodies that you guys can pick from. I would really advise that you get over there. So anyway, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. And we'll oh, see you God, next time. Amazing. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night.